Welcome everyone again to Clayton Library Presents. Today we're very pleased to bring um, Amanda Fallis from the New Orleans City Archives and Special Collections. I'm really excited to bring Amanda to, or well, Joy uh, is excited to, <laughs> thank you Joy for bringing Amanda to us. Um, uh, she is a librarian and certified archivist in the New Orleans Public Library City Archives and Special Collections, which is the official repository of the administrative archives of the city of New Orleans. She works with local government records, academic researchers, digital collections, genealogical and historical education groups, public outreach and program development. And she loves sharing New Orleans and Louisiana genealogy researcher resources with researchers across the country. And I am looking super forward to getting educated on something I know very little about. Amanda, thank you so much. Oh, thank you all for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Joy and Sue. This is a really exciting opportunity, and I'm so glad to see everybody who's come today. Um, so I am Amanda Fallis, and I am an archivist at New Orleans Public Library, and let's get this presentation started. Okay, here we go. Okay, strap in, everybody. We have a lot to cover. Um, so today we'll be going over genealogy resources in the New Orleans City Archives and Special Collections held at New Orleans Public Library. Um, I'll also be addressing kind of general Louisiana records and some resources for South Louisiana, North Louisiana, not in depth, but enough that you should um, be able to build your uh, resource list if you haven't seen some of these. Let's start with talking about the city archives and special collections. Um, we specialize in records from records and um, books and monographs about Louisiana, New Orleans, and the Gulf South. Obviously, the emphasis is on the New Orleans. Um, we are the official repository for the city of New Orleans, meaning when our elected officials in municipal government makes records, they are supposed to transfer it to us. Um, and then at that juncture, we make sure to keep what has enduring value. And over the years, what our department has done is found that a lot of these records can be used for genealogical resources. And, you know, since the 70s, at least, we've done a lot of work in terms of microfilming and working with other organizations to digitize a lot of stuff. Um, it's, um, we're doing our best. We all have smart, small department, though. Um, we do have a lot of reference materials. We have a lot of original materials. We have a lot of printed materials. We also have a lot of photographs um, that uh, I will, um, that are actually um, at least 13,000 of them we've managed to digitize and put up on our website. So we have a lot of photographs that are readily available to anybody to look at. And then of course the microfilm and then our records have ended up in a lot of digital databases, which I'll address. Um, so the archives were transferred to the public library by ordinance in 1946 and we were incorporated it was incorporated as our responsibility in the city charter of 1954. Um, so we do reside in the main library of the um, new orleans public library system and uh, we are employees of the library system um, the earliest records in the city archives date from 1769, and those are the acts and deliberations of the Cabildo, which was the Spanish government. Here's a quick tour of our basement. We, um, believe it or not, we operate out of two basements in New Orleans, Louisiana. They are, however, um, nuclear bomb shelters as they were built in 1958 and um, surrounded by a 12 foot concrete bowl that's in turn surrounded by a French drain, which drains any water before it approaches the lip of the bowl. So we are okay and we have been okay in terms of water. We're the safest basement in New Orleans and one of the only ones too. <laughs> we have about, um, something like around uh, 75,000 square feet of space. And we have around 50,000 square feet, I mean, linear feet of records. As you can see, um, city planning commission books, mayors, all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> um, let's get started by talking about how to navigate our resources. So this is our page. This is the clearinghouse for all of our stuff. Um, this web page will get you to a description and uh, will allow you to search our entire holdings. It is just HTML, but it's very versatile. It's, um, it's definitely something that you want to check out just to see what we have. And our page is archives. 
www.nolalibrary.org. The uh, main library's website is just nolalibrary.org. Whoops. There we go. So this is a, a sample of all our listed guides in finding aids. As you can see, we have several sections. We have um, we have a research guide, you know, that has obviously evolved um, with the times. We do offer limited search and copy services, although we have expanded those a little bit since you know the advent of the pandemic. So there are a few more things that we're able to get people. Um, we are, as, as you can see, the, um, our primary focus is a city archive, so we have lots of records of agencies, courts, mayors, police, all sorts of um, government bodies. Then you can see our photograph collection and digital galleries, and that's actually where our programs link is as well for um, programs that we put on. We uh, record and put all our, our programs on YouTube as well. So you can get program descriptions, handouts, and links to the YouTube videos through the program link, which is not on this screen, but is on a later screen. I apologize. Um, we do have uh, some special. collections of Mardi Gras ephemera. We have, you know, dance cards from, you know, 1800s um, balls. Uh, we also have um, personal um, connections donated to us and, um, you know, just uh, assorted things. Generally, they're all described. Um, and then, of course, a lot of our records, what we've done over the decades is um, mined them for genealogical significance. So we actually have um, a guide that I'm going to show you in a second that's kind of the clearinghouse of what records we have that are of worth to genealogists. We also have a property research guide if you need to do property research in New Orleans. It's a multi-step thing. I highly recommend the guide. And then we have a lot of newspapers and serials on microfilm and physically. We have a lot of genealogy books and stuff, but we'll talk more about like how to possibly access those from, from if you're not in New Orleans. So um, for genealogy, I would say our primary links are the Louisiana Biography and Obituary Index, which is a special um, local newspaper index of obituaries that volunteers put together um, starting in the 1940s. I'll go on about it later in the presentation. And really the clearinghouse is the second one, the Guide to Genealogical Materials. And this is it. This is a wonderful guide that was assembled by um, our um, previous city archivist, uh, Irene Wainwright and Wayne Everard. Um, they did this wonderful thing where they essentially went through all the records and were able to organize them into this online guide that tells you whatever you need to know about our holdings. Like if you wanna know what we have, um, as you can see here in terms of like what databases we have, what newspapers we have, um, vital records, what vital records access we have. Of course, I am going to be going all this over all this in a moment, but civil records, census records, Orleans Parish court records, whatever type of record you're looking for and you wanna know what we have or where you can get it, if, it, if not in person, um, this guide is really, really the main place to be. Um, so since we are talking about virtual versus non-virtual, I did want to talk about um, records that you would have to come in person to use. Luckily, it's not very many anymore because one, we're offering, you know, expanded remote um, copy services. And two, because things, you know, have been digitized, um, more things have been digitized. But um, this is a list of records that you might need to visit to use, which includes select court records, the ones that weren't microfilmed or digitized, you know, that relate more to um, other stuff like bankruptcies, criminal courts, um, city and parish archival records and documents. Because um, we hold so much material and we are constantly getting more and more material from that have that's been created in the Collins. It's it's a lot more than 100 people with 100 computers and 100 hour weeks could hope to digitize. But um, we do try to make them easily accessible as a public archives. Um, there are some local burial records that you might need to come in to look at, but they're fairly limited and it's 
wonderful that we have sites like Find a Grave and large sites now that have done a lot of um, the catalog of these cataloging of graves and people in them. Um, so there's some non-digitized newspapers that we have on microfilm. One, one in particular is the African Weekly newspaper, Louisiana Weekly. I would say that's our primary, um, what I feel is our most valuable newspaper that hasn't otherwise been digitized. It's still um, a, a publication in print today, so we don't own the rights and we don't have, we're not able to digitize it. Um, but it is available via microfilm. Um, we do have lots of building plans, um, lots and lots. Mostly, they're mostly um, historically significant and city-owned properties. Um, most just residential houses, those those building plans were never retained by the city and, and, and do not pass on the archives, just, just residential construction. Um, some genealogy books, although I'm finding more and more, like a lot of places, including poss probably um, HRMC, is, uh, you know, have a lot of the same genealogy books we do. And I know, uh, you know, ProQuest and other archi or online sources have kind of like started to digitize um, family histories and other genealogy books, but we do still have a lot. And, you know, you might need to come and look at them. And then our hospital and church records, which, just just to put this in perspective, there there's not a huge amount of them, and many of them were done by the um, the uh, Church of Latter Day Saints. So you can still access them through their family history centers, which I know there are a couple in Houston. So um, when you're using our website, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of like how you know what you're looking at and how you you know how it's available. And so I've got these examples of record availability. So if you're on our website and you're looking at something, if a record's available on microfilm, it's gonna have that little MF that you see there that I've um, outlined in green on the screen. Um, and it's gonna give a roll number and any description. So that means the, the record is available on microfilm. And there will probably be a note in the description of the guide. Um, we have, most of our microfilm is not available for interlibrary loan. Um, we do have a large collection that was um, uh, microfilmed by um, a National Endowment for the Humanities grant um, a couple decades ago, and those are pre-1863 materials. And those we generally do have second copies of, and we can ILL. If you're ever interested in that, I mean, it, or anything, just email us. All, that email address will come up several times. But um, in general, you may need to come in to view a lot of our film that isn't otherwise digitized or otherwise available. Now, if a record is available physically, there's just not going to be anything there. There's not gonna be um, an MF, any there will probably be a note in the description about like at the top of the web page about like formats and availability. And yes, you must come in for these. Um, records available digitally. We try to put a link next to the item. We are updating our links very slowly. So, um, you know, if it doesn't work, I recommend Googling the words in the link. And um, there will probably be a note in the collection description that something's available digitally. Generally, when something's available digitally, that's the preferred method of essaying it, mainly for, for safety reasons for both um, these days, for both people and materials, but primarily to make sure that the materials, um, the original materials are not damaged or made unavailable because the original materials are where all these duplications come from. So I'm gonna address some of the records that we have that you should be able to access in various database services. I know Houston Public Library provides a lot of the same genealogy um, databases that we do for free. So I'm gonna cover a lot of the resources that there's, there, there would never be a reason for you to come in for. Um, these are, these are uh, some of the uh, many services on which our records appear. Uh, we have Ancestry Library Edition, Family Search, Heritage Quest, Fold 3, um, and then uh, uh, the US Gen Web Archives Project. Um, and then Family Search is kind of our big one. In fact, there are some records that um, we pretty much exclusively recommend you can only access through Family Search. This is just a short list of the very of the various Louisiana records they have. Um, as you can see, there's penitentiary records, there's Confederate pensions, there's service records, and then of course there's our Orleans Parish estate files, which is our probate slash succession work materials. Um, 
for the various courts. I'll explain um, sort of a very brief explanation of the court system when we get to that section. But they also have the will books in their entirety. Um, later, um, Orleans Parish court records and um, 1812 pension list, and then a whole bunch of other stuff that concerns Louisiana in general. Um, many newspapers are digitized that we have, and they're available through um, sources like Genealogy Bank or newspapers.com um, if you want to access them from home. Uh, I'm not sure the breadth of the subscription options that Houston Public Library's News Bank subscription brings you. I don't, I don't know if they include New Orleans. Um, I'll ask a question at the end of the session. Um, but uh, these generally, these listed papers, which are the major papers, the Daily Picayune slash Times Picayune, the New Orleans item, the states and the merge, later merged states item, all of these papers have eventually merged to create the Times Picayune and Advocate, which is our current iteration. And those are all available through newsbank slash genealogy bank. Um, newspapers.com has a lot of smaller Orleans and Gulf South and um, Louisiana newspapers. I find it very worthwhile to look through the Southeast, um, you know, newspaper section of there, because a lot of things that previously we only had on microfilm are now on there. Um, we do have a lot of newspapers still on microfilm. We have almost all New Orleans newspapers, 1787 to present. Um, the earliest newspaper is a Paris paper, and it just happens to have New Orleans content. Um, the earliest New Orleans paper is Moniteur de la Louisiana. It is from 1802, and it is in French. And the first English language New Orleans paper, the Louisiana Gazette, is from 1804. Um, we do have a bunch of other um, digitized microfilm from other small places, local places, Araby, um, little towns that are in our general area, like West, the West Bank, which is what we call, you know, across the river from New Orleans, um, which is generally in Jefferson Parish, um, Araby, small in St. Bernard Parish, St. Bernard Voice. We have, we just have a lot of like local, um, smaller newspapers on microfilm. It's never a full run, but we do have some, and this is listed on our website. Um, and we have a few out of state newspapers. It, it happens. Um, if you didn't know, which I imagine you all do, many genealogists use newspapers to find obituaries. And um, like I said, a list of newspapers we hold on microfilm can be found on our website. City directories. So really a majority of our city directories are entirely available on Ancestry.com and HeritageQuest. As you can see here, it's the New Orleans city directories, 1861 to 1860. And then there's, um, you know, for some earlier ones, there are partial transcriptions on um, the US Gen Web archives for those years that you see there. But um, what's most important is 1806 to 1861 are on microfiche in our department. Now we do, we, we will totally look um, names up remotely, um, you know, within our guidelines, um, you know, reasonable size request, reasonable um, time period, but um, we will look, um, names up via request, um, search and copy services on the microfilm ones. Um, and then of course, if you didn't already know this, some years they just didn't publish a city directory. It happens. Um, it's, it's not the majority of the time, but it does happen. And here's an example of the city directories as they appear on ancestry.com actually. So um, yeah, this is, this is what we have on microfilm and um, it's, the, it's the exact same thing but it's available on those services, Ancestry and Heritage Quest, both, both which you should have library access to. So this is um, a special thing that uh, we have in the department that found its genesis in the 1940s in the uh, Works Progress Administration um, work, work um, programs, which is the obituary indexing for New Orleans newspapers. So if you go to our website um, and go to the Louisiana Biography and Obituary Index, this is what it looks like. And so what it was is it was started by um, WPA workers in um, the late 1930s and early 1940s. And what they did was they went through all the physical bound newspapers and created index cards of um, every obituary that they found. And those index cards, which there's more than 650,000 of, were later in the early 2000s 
put into a database um, thanks to um, us in the historic New Orleans collection. Um, this work was done by volunteers. It's incredible um, and it's invaluable and it's completely free and online for y'all. So this is what it looks like. And if you click to search the index, this is the screen you'll see. Um, you'll you search by surname, last name, first name, middle name, or date of death. For those of you who have a lot of experience with database searching, it's always best to just start with the surname. Um, the more points you in you plug in, the you know the more chances you have to just not get a result from the database. So I always recommend just starting with the last name, and unless of course it's Smith, then then maybe add a first name. Um, but this is what it looks like when you enter one. So what you get from this is you get the listing and citations of the of the obituaries that ran, as you can see, Henry B. McMurray Jr. has um, multiple, um, you know, uh, entries, and they were all in the Daily Picayune. And so you would take this citation, then go to News Bank or Genealogy Bank, go to that date, and you could see it. Or you could, or you could mail us, and we can um, make copies, or email us, and you know, it, uh, in, um, a citation like this, and we'll send you. Um, a PDF, or you can do it by mail. It's generally, um, we'll do a couple for free, but generally it's, it's $2 a name. So um, there are a couple of other free obituary indexes for, for New Orleans and the locale, which there's a, um, um, so one of the places we go to after 1972 is the US Gen Web Archives um, volunteer one. So from 1972, and I'm sorry that says present, I meant 2012. From 1972 to 2012, there's indexing for the Times Picayune and obituaries um, on US Gen Web Archives, which is what USGW Archives stands for. Um, there's also a, a short um, obituary index at Jefferson Parish Public Library, but it's, it's a duplicate of these things. I believe East Baton Rouge Parish also has um, a, a, um, a Baton Rouge Advocate um, limited uh, index for obituaries too. But um, really from 2012 into the present, what you want to seek out is the website legacy.com. Um, that would be the primary way to find obituaries in really in the present day. Um, so the, I just want to say a little bit more about the Orleans Parish U.S. Gen, Gen Web um, archives page. Um, it, was, it was a nationwide group of volunteers that provided free genealogy websites and data for genealogical research in every county and every state in the United States. Um, it was non-commercial and it was committed to free genealogy access and it still remains up to this day. Um, of course, obviously I've directed you directly to Orleans with this link, but you can do Louisiana, you can do any parish. And this is just a, a, you know, a rehash of what they, what they do have, which is they have some city directory excerpts from earlier directories, the time picky and obituary index. Um, they have some marriage, death and birth certificate indexing. You can do this for ones that um, occurred before like 1918. Um, but there's also, um, there is also a secretary of state index, which I'll, I'll probably um, talk about way too much. <laughs> in this section, which is the vital records section for birth, marriage, and death. So vital records in Orleans Parish and Louisiana. Here's, here's the, um, here are the parameters. So vital records were not required by the state of Louisiana until 1918. Now some did occur sporadically and were, were kept sporadically, especially in Orleans. Orleans had um, a significant tradition of keeping vital records, um, but other parishes, you know, slower to adopt, um, pretty spotty. Um, so uh, the way Louisiana is a closed record state, which I don't believe Texas is, but we have restrictions on when you can view certain vital records. Um, so what we have here is older birth and deaths are available through the Secretary of State. And when I say older, I mean more than 100 years ago for births and more than 50 years ago for deaths and marriages. Um, older Orleans, specifically Orleans only marriages are available through the Secretary of State website as well. Um, generally, all other parish marriages, they're only at the local clerk of court. And yes, throughout time, there have been various fires and, you know, loss and each, each parish, depending on its funding, you know, um, makes the accessibility of these records, um, you know, different. 
So newer births less than 100 years ago and deaths less than 50 years ago, those are only available to immediate family members through the Louisiana Department of Health. You have to, um, you would need to contact them in the vital records department, but um, generally I believe you have to prove that your um, sibling, child, grandchild, parent, or grandparent, but um, I don't work there. So definitely contact them. I'll have contact info for them further in the um, presentation. Um, newer marriages less than 50 years, even in Orleans Parish, um, are at the local clerk of court. So um, if you're looking for a marriage in Orleans Parish that's less than 50 years old, you would actually need to go to the Orleans Parish clerk of court and not um, the Secretary of State. Uh, some of these New Orleans records can be found on microfilm at the city archives. Um, these are just duplicates of what I've, I'm going to list in these Secretary of State sites. Um, of course, you know, prior to the pandemic, it, it was sometimes easier for people to just come in and make the copies themselves if they were visiting New Orleans. You know, now um, I find going through the Secretary of State website and requesting it that way is the ideal thing to do. And then um, there's a newer, as in like the last four or five years, there's the Louisiana clerk's portal where some parish clerk records, they've started to maybe digitize and make avail available um, at this website, which is free to sign. You sign up, but it's free and it's the laclerksportal.org. So that's a resource to maybe poke through what records um, other parishes are starting to make available to people. I know a lot of more recent records, you would still need to go to the clerk of court because they do want you to pay um, access fees for a lot of them. So birth certificates, we don't have them. There's no birth certificates at the Louisiana division. Um, and there's no, there's no um, originals in the Louisiana division either. That was the one um, record type that the secretary of state wanted turned over in its entirety um, when they uh, initiated this in 1918. So we don't have any birth certificates. You do have to request them in the following manners, which is 1790, and that should say um, 19, oh no, 1913 is correct. 1730 to 1930, or well, I guess it's 1921 now, because it's hundred years. Um, 1790 to 1921, you would need to go to the state archives. And I've got their website right here, which is sos.la.gov. 1918 to present, or 1921 to present, Office of the State Registrar, which as you can see here, or the State Health Department is ldh.la.gov. Um, again, before 1918, very few birth certificates were issued in the state outside of Orleans Parish. Um, there is um, another record source that you can go to that I'll go over um, next, in the next section after vital records. Um, so indexing. Um, indexing is available for through 1899 on Ancestry and Heritage Quest. So that's very helpful if you want to look through birth records indexing. But I always recommend just going straight to the Secretary of State website. It's sos.la.gov. And then you click on historical resources research. I'll show you in a second. But um, that's that's the best index for finding birth records as well as um, marriage and death as I'll note. This is an example of a birth certificate. Um, it looks like this is from the year of our Lord, 1860. So death certificates more than 50 years old will be at the Louisiana, excuse me. And then less than 50 years old will of course be the office of the state registrar health department. There's indexing for New Orleans deaths on microfilm on Ancestry and Heritage Quest and on the US Gen Web archives um, and additional Louisiana deaths on microfilm online. Of course, once again, they're all available on secretary sos.la.gov in their vital records index. Um, in terms of what our death certificates show, uh, they generally always record name, place of birth um, or nativity age, sometimes profession, uh, the date, and sometimes the time of the death, the place of death, it'll always generally give the address. So this can also be used as a way to cross-link to city directories um, and the cause of death. Uh, earlier death certificates, they will sometimes have the parents and spouse um, and go so far as to have the place of birth of parents, as well as a deceased marital status and the name of the person making the declaration. 
And this is an example of a death certificate from uh, 1891. Um, so it's, as you can see, or well, I'll tell you what it says, is it um, says at the corner of, um, oh goodness, um, some street and magazine, uh, which is the death, I can't read that actually. Um, unfortunately, the nature of old records. But um, as you can see, uh, the, that um, Mary Jacob, the lawful wife of Marceline Clouseau um, from Alsace, France, age 65 years, departed this life this day, uh, 3rd December, 1891. And um, so that, that's an example of some of the information you can get from one of the death certificates. This is a copy of the, from the microfilm. Marriage records. So um, Orleans Parish Justice of the Peace records, uh, those um, go from 1846 to 1880. They coincide with um, one of our court systems. Uh, parents' names are not given unless one of the parties was minor. Uh, there's no unless they were married by no certificates available unless they were married by a justice of the peace. This is a civil record. So there's if they didn't get the civil record, they, you know, were not civilly married. A lot of people didn't know that. And um, there would be Catholic marriages that might occur that did not have a justice of the peace record associated with them. But you, luckily, you can contact the archives of the Archdiocese of New Orleans, which I'll go into a little bit in a minute. Um, the recorder of births, deaths, and marriages and Board of Health records are a little later. That's 1870 to 1915. Um, certificates are included by this time and the parents' names are given. So it can be very helpful. And again, these can be um, requested either from us or through the Secretary of State. So, so again, I'm a little bit of a broken record about this, but it's important to know that um, marriages that are after... 1880, but are more than 50 years old, are at the Louisiana State Archives on sos.la.gov, and less than 50 years old must be obtained from the Orleans Parish Clerk of Court, Civil District Court. So, um, as I said earlier, and again, marriages and other parishes remain with the clerks of court in the parish. Some are digitized at LA Clerk's Portal. And here's um, indexing for Orleans Parish marriage records. Our main index that's very helpful and is based off a index card file that we have in the Louisiana department is, is the online index, which is totally available online on our website there. Um, this is the long, I mean, you can either try typing in that URL or you could just go to our website, archives.nolalibrary.org, click on the genealogical guide and then click on marriage records. Um, Board of Health records, uh, same thing. Some people have done some indexing on US Gen Web's archives. It's also available on Ancestry.com and of course on Microfilm. And then your main place to start for indexing again is sos.la.gov. So this is an example of our 1846 to 1880 index on our website. So as you can see, there's, they're organized by either bride or groom name. So you can look at them either way. Um, when you click into the initial index, but what it shows, and these are all important for if you want to like say order a copy from us or come find it yourself in in house, is um, that that date, that call number, and those pages. That and, and of course the names, but this is how we would locate a record to make um, a PDF copy of the microphone for you. And here's an example of a Justice of the Peace marriage certificate from 1854. Um, so as you can see, it's relatively, um, there's not a lot of information here, but it's enough. Um, you can see Mr. and Mrs. and you can see the maiden name and you can see the witnesses who oftentimes were relatives of some sort and they would sign. And then the contracting parties, which are going to be the two being married and, um, the justice of the peace. So this is the Secretary of State Vital Records Index that I have been talking about over and over and over again. You wanna to go to sos.la.gov. Then you wanna click, as I've got circled down here in the picture, historical resources and research historical records. And then you'll scroll through a paragraph and there's a link to the Vital Records Index. That's your place to start when you're looking for birth, death and marriage in New Orleans and Louisiana. Um, here's a tip. Um, the reason that I uh, don't just give you a website is because it's about this long, <laughs> the way they have it organized. So um, one of my tips is when you're in Google, just type 
the phrase Louisiana Secretary of State Vital Records Index, and it will actually get you generally directly to the index most of the time. So again, it has index entries for vital records that are open to the public. You can mail order birth, death, and marriage certificates from this website. Um, you can do the same for a decent amount of them with us, except the birth records, of course. And again, don't forget, Louisiana did not require vital records until 1918. So when you're hitting a wall with civil vital records, it's, it's often important to look into um, religious or in our case, Catholic sacramental records. Um, the uh, archdiocese and dioceses of New Orleans were excellent records keepers. Many, many Louisiana um, descendants are um, Catholic and the records are usually a good place to check if you're not finding a civil record. So um, let's see here. So of course, Catholic sacramental records are only available through dioceses and churches. Now each, there's five dioceses in Louisiana, including the Archdiocese of New Orleans. They each have different accessibility issues. You, you have to pretty much go to that one to find out. But um, the records do go back much further than civil vital records. I mean, New Orleans, they go to the 1700s. Um, and then uh, you guys may or may not be familiar with this, but there's um, a collection of transcription books of a lot of these records for across the state. There's like, you know, different, um, it, you know, like there's Western, Southeastern, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, but um, uh, many of them were called the Father Hebert books because they were written by Father Abor, Hebert. And um, he just did transcriptions of all these sacramental records. So um, they're very handy. If there is not a set available anywhere near you, um, I might try asking Houston Public Library about um, interlibrary loaning them, or, or you can come visit us. And I believe the Archdiocese also makes them limited avail lim available in a limited way. You may have to buy them. Um, so of course, uh, I find that the most readily available Catholic records are the records from the Archdiocese of New Orleans. Um, they have a whole process where you, and it is entirely by mail. They, they have very, very limited, they have a staff of like two, um, you know, handling hundreds of thousands of records. But um, they have, but they are, luckily they make all of their um, requirements and rules and request policies clear on their website here. And um, so I highly recommend it. Um, the other dioceses in Louisiana are the Diocese of Baton Rouge. They also have a great website. They also have a very clear request process. Um, the Diocese of Homa, um, that one, um, it does have contact information for the person. So you can contact them about getting archival records. And um, there's the Diocese of Lafayette, which to um, my understanding, didn't for a while offer remote services, but has started to offer some. Um, and then the Diocese of Alexandria still does not seem to be offering a remote genealogy services, but they still have a website. So you can you know, possibly call or email them to find out more. And those are the dioceses of, of Louisiana here, these five. And, and so as I was talking about the Father Hebert books, um, so all, if you wanna find the titles of these books, they're all available in our online catalog, which if you just go to nolalibrary.org and, and go to the catalog, you can look at it. Um, other Louisiana libraries, as well as libraries in nearby states like, like Texas might have holdings. And I recommend checking the website worldcat.org for them. So um, if you look up Donald J. Bear in Southwest Louisiana Records, as you can see in the middle of the bottom of the page here on WorldCat, they have a little thing in the results where you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you the nearest libraries that, um, and this would be the libraries that share their information with WorldCat, which not every library does, but it'll tell you the nearest libraries that have access to these books. Um, Back in our genealogy guide, we have a great list of titles. And um, as I said, you might request what's called an interlibrary loan through Houston Public Library or your local public library to try to get copies of these books um, to, to borrow. So burial records. So there is a list of municipal cemetery records available in the New Orleans City Archives and it can be found on our website. There is no comprehensive index to all of the cemeteries in New Orleans. There's just 
There's too many of them. We have a lot of cemeteries. We have cemeteries that have been forgotten and covered up very early cemeteries. Um, we have cemeteries that have been remembered. We have tons of cemeteries. And we also have um, a uh, sort of bifurcated system in that we have like the city, the um, cemeteries that are run by the municipal, by the city. And then, um, of course, the Catholic cemeteries, which is a huge system. The Catholic cemeteries make up, you know, a, a, a majority of the cemeteries in the city. Um, so there is no comprehensive index, but there are places you can go. So, of course, there's the perennial find a grave. It's, it's the classic. And as people um, share more information with it, it's a very good resource. Um, there is a local group in New Orleans called SaveOurCemeteries.org, which has a lot of cemetery information. Um, and then the agency governing the Catholic cemeteries is called New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. They have a website. They have some indexing. They have some databases. They're working on 360 degree virtual tours. They have, they, they've really um, expanded their offerings a lot. So NOLA Catholic Cemeteries.org is a great website to put down for that for searching New Orleans cemeteries. Um, and then for the state at large, there's la-cemeteries.com. It's another volunteer um, indexing project. So um, as I said, um, it was is because New Orleans is predominantly a Catholic city, um, there are many cemeteries are Catholics. So the Archdiocese of New Orleans is an important organization to contact, whether that be for burial records and any of the archdioceses, the same thing. You might wanna to try to get a burial record. And um, here's the links to the Archdiocese of New Orleans and New Orleans Catholic cemeteries, which are both places that you would want to hit up if you're looking for um, a Catholic relative's burial place. Um, and I'm not sure I mentioned this, but sacramental records include generally baptism, marriage, funeral, and burial. So um, it's, it's, depending on how each uh, diocese handles it, you'll be requesting one sacramental per record per request of those four types. So um, this is just, you know, advice for, um, you know, finding people. Um, if you don't know the cemetery, ask yourself questions about the person. So number one, most important, what was the religion? I'm not saying that Protestants didn't get buried in Catholic cemeteries, but generally, you know, it's, it's important to know. Um, many times, where did they live? That would determine the parish. And then from the parish, you would hopefully try to um, trace, you know, where they might've um, been buried. Although there are no guarantees by any means, like, like location does not, necessarily directly lead you to somebody's burial place. Um, if you know where other family members are buried, that's a good, that's a good lead. Um, now, because many, um, of course, many uh, um, cemeteries were segregated, um, the race or ethnicity does matter. Um, oftentimes um, the cemeteries were segregated internally um, in a lot of cases. And then um, what were the family's financial circumstances? Because there were also potter's fields and later just low cost fields. So um, I just wanna give you some quick links to uh, sort of civil record and genealogy departments in across Louisiana here. Um, clerk of court records, as I've said many times, um, are held in the individual clerk of court for each of our 64 parishes in Louisiana, parishes being what we call counties. Um, parish clerk of courts generally hold records relating to marriage, property conveyance, and probate or succession, um, inheritance, wills in Louisiana. Um, oftentimes when tracing enslaved ancestors, conveyance and probate records are necessary to trace sales inheritances and emancipations of the people. Um, so various parishes, again, have shared on the Louisiana clerk's portal. Um, in Orleans, the clerk of court is orleanscivilclerk.com. They are home to the notarial archives, which is um, great, of course, for conveyances, you know. Um, as for the um, the actual probate and succession, a lot of the older stuff is now in our possession. It was, it was transferred to us in the 70s. But if you're looking at conveyances and sales, um, that you would still want to go to the notarial archives for that. Um, in Jefferson Parish, it's 
jpparishclerkofcourt.us. Don't worry, all this stuff is in your handouts, I promise. Um, Baton Rouge, and, and a lot of these have like an archives or genealogy department. So there's the Baton Rouge EBR Clerk of Court Department's Archives Genealogy. There's the St. Tammany Clerk of Court, um, which is an excellent, um, it's an excellent archives. Um, it's run by Robin and um, she's, it's an excellent place to do research. It's a nice facility. And, you know, um, New Orleans and, and St. Tammany um, have a lot of like, you know, um, cross records, especially in the early days. Um, Terrebonne, Homa, they have um, a clerk with an archives. Uh, the Calcasieu Parish has a Calcasieu clerk of court. Uh, you'd need to contact them. Rapides, which is Alexandria, Rapides clerk, and Caddo, which is Shreveport, which is Caddo clerk. So all of these are in your handout. Um, some major areas have genealogy departments that I would recommend many, many times because they can get you in touch with local genealogy organizations, which are always a great like resource is contacting, you know, the genealogy organizations in the place you're looking at. Um, uh, Jefferson Parish has a wonderful page where it's all just collected in one long list of links. That's this one right here. Um, and uh, the Baton Rouge Room and the Genealogy uh, Department at East Baton Rouge Parish is, 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 is excellent, as is uh, St. Tammany's. Um, and then Calcasieu Library does have a genealogy um, branch that is ready to help, as does Shreveport and Homa. So here's, here's, here's a fun part. Um, I'm actually going to go into detail on the Orleans Parish court records for y'all. Y'all are very lucky, I guess, maybe. Um, we'll, we'll find out what you think at the end. Um, it can be very complicated, but, and, and um, actually in your handout at the very end of it, I have an appendix that's a court record access chart miniature. And basically depend, it, it's organized each court in chronological order and we'll tell you how you can access it. So that's at the end of your handout, but let's get started on the Orleans Parish court records. So what's happened is these are actually parish records. So um, we're the municipal archives, meaning we're city archives. We're not parish archives. Now, New Orleans is an interesting case because it's what's called coterminous. So the area of both the parish and the city are exactly the same, but there are um, sort of a competing municipal um, record keeping um, methodologies. You know, the, there's the parish government and the city government. Um, we have over time just ended up with a lot of city, I mean, parish government records because there wasn't a formal parish archives. And many of these agencies just were holding onto records themselves and didn't really know what to do with them. Um, we have become the repository for the civil um, court records and criminal court records for those dates listed of Orleans Parish. So these were deposited to us by the courts in the 1970s and 80s. They, I think we're going to get rid of them and asked everybody in the city who was a repository, like an archives said, do you wanna take these? And we said, yes. So we have a lot of them. Um, we retain what we have. Um, any records missing today were not included in the transfer, and it happens. It happens. Um, what's great about these hundreds of thousands, if not a million records, is the genealogically significant ones, which were primarily probate, divorce, emancipation, and suits against succession, those were all microfilmed by the Genealogical Society of Utah, all also known as the Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, we actually had volunteers uh, working in our basement from 1985 to the early 1990s, microfilming all of these. And later on, on familysearch.org, they've digitized a lot of the microfilm. Um, the criminal courts remain largely unfilmed and also um, are, are still in their original um, format of being trifolded in the barrister's um, drawers. So indexing varies from court to court. Uh, that's what my court record access chart is for. Um, it'll tell you what kind type of indexing there is. Um, when you want to find a docket number or a case, you really need the name of the court and at least a date. So, um, or I'm sorry, just or a docket number. So what happened in New Orleans is we went through a change in our court system every 10 to 20 years. We have, um, and then some of our court systems included up to 
eight district courts that all handled different things or different areas. Um, it changed as time went on. Um, that court records cheat sheet uh, is your friend, but also reading about it on our website because we have a page for each court, you know, that has a description of what happened um, will kind of educate you. But really what you need is you need dates, you need court names and you need a docket number to find a case. Sometimes that stuff appeared in newspapers and in, in other places and other cases, you know, it just depends. But um, depending on the court, you might need to spend time going through docket books to find a docket number, many of which are digitized on family search. I'm, you know, uh, it's possible. We also have select prorate records for 48 additional parishes on microfilm. And that's again, courtesy of GSU, and many of them are being digitized on uh, familysearch.org or can be obtained at a local family history center. Um, so photocopies of records from other parishes, court, other court records, like especially like, you know, more modern ones like post 1890 something, um, must be obtained from the clerk of court in each parish. If you need to find out what a parish's clerk of court is, just Google the parish name and clerk of court and you'll get to it. Um, and again, some items are available on Louisiana clerk, LA clerks portal.org. So here's a brief overview of the types of court records that exist. There's wills in Louisiana. <coughs> there's wills, there's successions, there's estate inventories, there's divorces, there's emancipations, there's civil lawsuits, there's criminal cases. Again, see our website for an explanation of the various systems and times. Um, we do have indexing for a lot of them. And uh, a lot of that indexing is available on family search. So the court of probates, which is the earliest succession court, 1804 to 1846, um, is available on our website or on familysearch.org, whichever place you prefer to look. And that, what that'll do is you'll search a name and you'll get a docket number. And that will um, lead you to be able to look it up on familysearch.org because these are all digitized on family search, court of probates is. Um, Second district court, uh, which is the later system that started in 1846, 1880, second district court of the eight district courts was the one that handled probate at that time. And again, we have that indexed on our website and it's also indexed and digitized on familysearch.org. Now, civil district court, which is the modern system and the system that we still exist in today, we have from 1880 to 1926, but the indexing is limited. Um, we have an index for 1880 to 1903, and that's available on our website. 1904 to 1926, you would have to come look at our, our, our docket books on microfilm in the department. Of course, please see the court records chart handout at the end of the handout today. So this is an example of the indexing of the courts on our website. As you can see, you could theoretically just search our website for a last name and you might get a result that shows, you know, um, Egan, Eddie, docket number 14113, section A. This is the criminal court um, defendants index. And then um, here's an example from the court of probates, the early succession courts. So you could find out Eames, Lowell, you can find the succession year. It'll say if there's a will or an inventory. And with these early courts, the court of probate, there's actually not docket numbers for the successions. It's just a year and a name. So um, we also have a lot of emancipations which have almost entirely been digitized on the free Louisiana digital library.org by um, courtesy of Louisiana State University. Um, so emancipations in Orleans Parish, they were handled by the judge of parish court and um, they received the position of the slave owner and presented it to the police jury for consideration. Those were in 1814 to 1843. And then um, minors were often um, emancipated um, between the ages of 18 and 21. Uh, they would also have their emancipations among these records. Interdictions aren't necessarily indexed, but they are proceedings brought by relatives of business partners or other concerned parties against those no longer mentally sound enough to care for, those pro for their properties. So those do exist in court cases against successions. Um, there are lawsuits. While, these are, while the non-genealogical lawsuits are not necessarily indexed, um, you, you would probably need to look at a docket book 
or, or somebody else's research or a newspaper to find a docket number for one of these. But um, we can find and, and flatten them if you do have that. Um, criminal cases. We hold the Orleans Parish criminal court records from 1830 to 1932. Um, as I say here, most are not microfilmed. You'll have to look at docket books for a case number or hope that um, it was a trial that ended up in the newspaper because sometimes they will mention docket numbers there. So accessing court records. If a record is available in microfilm or digitally, that is how it must be viewed. Many records have deteriorated from physical handling and just from the materials that they were um, housed on. There is an early type of microfilm that our second district court records were um, filmed on that has since uh, succumbed to vinegar syndrome, which causes a breaking and warping and you know just un unusability. Luckily, those records are completely digitized on, on um, familysearch.org. So yeah, um, and the, the original physical records, sorry. Um, the original physical records, like we only release those to museums and exhibits. We, we do not bring those out for general use or research use. So if a court record isn't digitized or on microfilm, we have a whole process for that. Um, you need to, First, if you have obtained a docket number, you will need to email a request to check availability with the court number, I mean the court name, the docket number, and the defendant to us. You should do this at least a month before you hope to visit because the problem is, is not every court record made it over. They're described in different places, but that doesn't mean we have it. In fact, all our indexing is taken directly from index books. They're not cross-referenced to the actual records. So we are not 100% sure just because it appears in the index that we have it. Um, the idea is um, when we're able to go look at these original records, see if it's actually there. And then we, and we have to go do that manually. You know, it's, it's, um, it's something that you know takes some time. Um, if we do find the record, we'll send you a confirmation and we'll tell you like when we think you'll you would be able to come in to view the record. And so, depending on the state of the record, like many have been previously flattened, but a majority haven't. Um, that could be any day from any time period from three days to two weeks because the flattening process is delicate and does take some time if it if it hasn't previously been flattened. Um, of course, you will be notified if we can't find the record we're only able to supply what they actually gave us. Um, and then of course, just, just word to the wise, record searches are suspended during busy times, such as Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and other major holidays. Just call us with, or email us with any additional questions, please. This is the succession of William Goldsbury, 1838. So we have a listing um, and a listing of items and um, uh, I believe also um, possibly uh, debts and, and the cost over here. So digitized court records. Again, I've said many times that, um, they are, that many of them are available on familysearch.org. Really, really, if you're looking from 1804 to 1880, they're on familysearch.org. And this is what they look like. Um, you know, it kind of says Louisiana Orleans court records. I know they have a different font now, but this is essentially is still how it works. Um, they also have second district court case files. Um, they have estate files. So what they, they have like taken liberties with the names, but 1804 to 1846, that's the, um, the court of probates and 1846 to 1880 is the second district court. Um, and then of course the will books span pretty much the entire collection. If you're looking for a will, it's just chronological and you would find it in that collection. Um, the uh, first collection here, Louisiana Orleans Court Records, 1822 to 1880, that tends to include the various docket books and minute books that they did film and, and additional things like some marriage records, other loose records. Um, so yeah, as I just said, um, this, this is kind of what I just said. They have Orleans Parish estate, so estate files for the court of probates, the second district court, the will books, the court records, which as I said, are like docket books and indexes to, to the 1800s courts. And you can find links to all of these um, in our website and on our finding aids for each court. This is an example of what it looks like. Um, I find that you can zoom in very far on these images. These images are great. 
Um, you can save the image, you can print the image. It's, it's an excellent way to view them. So we have some other court records from smaller and earlier courts that uh, were digitized by the Louisiana State Library and made available on louisianadigitallibrary.org. Um, they're part of LSU's two collections. One is called the Bicentennial Purchase Collection and one is called the Free People of Color Collection. Um, the Louisiana Digital Library website can be slow, but the image quality is great. And um, it's also the only method for viewing some of the earliest court records, such as uh, parish court and city court, which are even earlier and were not genealogical, but were, um, but were um, business oriented and, and you know, other litigious, just litigious courts that you could see, you can see these on the Louisiana Digital Library .org. Um, so for example, the purchase, Bicentennial Purchase Collection has the Court of Pleas, the city and county court civil suits, which is, you know, people suing each other, um, the county court criminal suits for three years, and the city court criminal suits for a couple years there. So these are very early courts, and they were very, you know, the um, number of records was small, so they were able to digitize these things. Um, so the other collection is the Free People of Color collection. This includes digitizations of the emancipations that I mentioned earlier, as well as um, like um, the uh, first municipality, which was a type of city government at the time, emancipation docket, um, various free people of color enslaved documents, indentures. And this collection is actually assembled from um, institutions across New Orleans. All of these records were gathered together. It's, it's an excellent resource which um, I'll have some links to in um, our African-American genealogy resources. Um, in, in a city like New Orleans, um, obviously these records are intermingled, but um, there are specific things that will be of use to people with um, free people of color and enslaved ancestors. Um, so of course, what's great is the slave manifest for New Orleans from 1807 to 1860 are available at Ancestry.com or on microfilm in our department. Um, we have an entire section of the genealogy guide devoted to various records that we have and, and ones that you can get to easily. And then of course, here's the LSU Free People, Free People of Color database that includes the digitizations. Um, other websites that I recommend are, um, it's the University of North Carolina Gainesville, um, race and slavery petitions project. Um, it incorporates some of our indexing in there, but it's also a, you know, aimed at getting a lot of records from across the slaveholding South. Um, there are of course collections in Ancestry Heritage Quest and Fold 3. Um, one of the big ones is slavevoyages.org. That's, that's a sort of central place to get to a lot of other um, slavery resources. And then um, there is the slavebiographies.org website, specifically the databases. And these feature work by, um, or the databases assembled by Gwendolyn Midlow Hall and Brian K. Mitchell, um, which are great for Orleans records. Immigration and naturalization records. Um, so what it is, is we have passenger lists which are immigration. Um, and those are digitized and available through ancestry.com and heritage quest. And then there's information without images available at familysearch.org. Um, these are, there's no need to come in and look at our passenger list. Um, they're just actually microfilm from the national archives that we bought and have in our department. And that, as you can see here, ancestry.com is digitized and made available. Um, which is also on Her Heritage Quest, which both of which you should be able to access for free through the library. Um, passenger arrivals for other ports like New York can be found in the same collection in the same way. Um, you may be interested in these things because they include the name of the passenger, gender, age, country point of origin, date of arrival, name of ship. Um, it, it, it can be spotty and some people didn't necessarily get a passenger list record. Sometimes it, they just slip through the cracks. Um, what's important about naturalizations is there was no actual legal requirement that an individual be naturalized or reside in the United States before 1906. Um, and those records give very little information. And yes, your ancestor could reside 
almost, I mean, their entire life in, in, you know, own, own land and a business and all sorts of things um, without ever naturalizing. Um, I know a lot of people when they're searching for naturalization records, some want them to uh, exist and some don't want them to exist because uh, I know part of one of the requirements, say for Italian dual citizenship, I, I don't, don't ask me more questions than this because I really don't know. But um, I do know that like, I think one of the requirements is that your ancestor not be naturalized, but that's also proving a negative. So it's very weird to do. Um, you can request um, naturalization records from us. Um, and it's based entirely on the index cards that are available through ancestry.com and heritage quest or, or which we also have on microfilm too. But um, if you send us one of these, we can use Fort Orleans Parish. We can't do other parishes. Um, we can try, and, and it's also for specific years, but it, luckily the, the, um, we'll let you know. But um, as you can see here, we can use this to go into our microfilmed court records and get you a copy of the, um, the um, certificate or the petition. Um, the actual naturalization records are federal records that, so you would, would need to go to USCIS for, you know, the full record. They do cost a lot though. Um, all of the information is on our website under search and copy services for requesting naturalizations. A note about where these records were created. They got created in civil courts. They got created in criminal courts. They got created in the local federal court, which is the court for the Eastern district of Louisiana. Um, you basically just got it created in whatever court you could walk to. That was a court of record. Um, and that included criminal courts. So just because you're naturalized in a criminal court doesn't mean anything. It just means it was the closest court building. Um, indexing for a lot of these are available on Ancestry and Heritage Quest as part of the U.S. Naturalization Records Index. Um, they are available on Microfilm as well, but it's the same indexes as are on Ancestry.com and Heritage Quest. Really last but not least, we have, we have a lot of photograph collections. We have around 50 collections digitized with uh, tens of thousands of images. Um, they're primarily photographs taken by city agencies and they depict the business of the municipal government of New Orleans. Um, a lot of, a majority of them like range from like 1940 to 1970, sorry. Um, you can always look at these anywhere, anytime. They're right linked on our website and they're totally searchable. So um, we, we've got um, a section on our uh, main website, archives.nolalibrary.org, which we're in the, trans the process of transitioning everyone to sort of our new setup that looks more um, polished and is mobile friendly, which um, is uh, that second one, that second link there. But both of them, you can reach by just going to archives.nolalibrary.org and scrolling down to our programs and presentation and digital collections section. Just click on that photographs and digital collections. It'll lead you to where you can search the ones that haven't been moved. And if you click on another link, search the ones that have been moved. Um, there's, this is also um, an example of our programs and presentation section, um, as I uh, described earlier, where every time we give a program, we'll have links to the YouTube videos and any um, handouts and materials and, and resources. Here's some of our pictures. Um, it's a lot of mayors and city councilors doing things. My favorite is um, uh, Ernest Dutch Morial in the bottom right here, um, letting kids do the first demo of some, uh, I believe some um, French market renovations. And then of course there's the A team or whatever walking in front of city hall at the bottom left there. That's Mayor Skiro and his city council. Oh, and then right in the middle on the bottom, we have uh, Mayor Moon Landrew, the father of Mitch at the national mayor's conference with Gerald Ford in the middle. And these are, um, so as, as I said, it's a lot of the municipal, municipal dealings of the city. So we have lots of public works images, you know, stuff, building, building roads, building bridges, building um, buildings. <laughs> and then um, we do, this is entirely digitized too. And we've gone to great lengths to make all the information on these cards that was written on the back of these cards searchable, but we have a very small collection of mugshots. Um, these are all the mugshots we have. They're all petty crimes. There's no major crimes. And um, they, they cover a period of the late 1800s to the very early 1900s, but we've digitized everything. So if we do have a mugshot, 
um, you can find it. Um, we don't have any hidden mugshots or anything like that. Um, you know, each city agency um, has had its own relationship between itself, the city archives, and the transferring of records um, throughout time. It's it's changed with every year, or, you know, so. So we get some things, we don't get everything. Um, and some things may still be um, on hold, like in, in the possession of the agencies that created them. So finally, um, that is it. Uh, we can, I'm ready for some questions if uh, wow. we would like to move on to the section. <laughs> oh, and let me, put, let me put up our contact information before, um, this is us. So. It's also on the handout, but I can- No, you can leave it, that's fine. Wow, wow, that was amazing. I learned as um, an inordinate amount, again, not being from down here. And then it's always been such a mystery, you know, as, you know, New Orleans and things like that. I just, <clears throat> a lot of, there's just a lot, a lot, a lot of takeaways. Um, I, I like the idea, you know, calling seems to be the best policy first to engage whether you have it, whether it's digitized, that type of thing, huh? And, and, and definitely definitely our website for sure, especially if you're looking for specific names, specific people, definitely go to our website and we have that search bar right at the top. It only searches our records at archives.nolalibrary.org. Just search mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, from there, for sure. Email us, um, call us. We're open uh, Monday through Friday, 10 to five, generally. So. And for, you mentioned the Father Bear books and all those new, you know, those regional uh, records for, uh, and using WorldCat, which is a great source because, you know, so many people are visiting us today from out of the way places and then using WorldCat to find out if a library in the area has it, or as you mentioned, um, some of the parishes have genealogy societies, or we do research, you do research. So mm -hmm. using WorldCat, huh? And in, in looking at all the uh, citations in your handout and trying to find other books using WorldCat for that too, so. And, and you can call us if you want to know more. And then, and then just before I'm going to hand it over to Mitch in a second, but the importance of, you know, using family search and searching for digital images, because when you take a trip or when you engage a repository, you know, you want to go there for what's unique that you can't get digitized or through the mail or something like that. So just, uh, you know, like you mentioned, calling using your, your website to try and find that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, well, here's Mitch, who uh, he and Justin are the technology backbone of the of this show. So, Mitch. <laughs> wow, that was a lot of information. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I've seen that much packed into one show. That was great. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda. Um, I do have just a couple of questions here. I think everybody's still kind of uh, digesting everything there. Uh, <laughs> Terry uh, or Sindentarian asks uh, if something is uh, indexed, is everything in the collection indexed? I guess they're asking about things that might be partially indexed or, or could you just go through the indexing? Um, no, uh, so not everything is indexed. It depends on the record. And that's mm -hmm. what we rely on the guide to genealogical materials for the most and why we really recommend that people look at it. It used to be a published book that we sold until you know we moved it entirely online. but. Um, it's, it depends. Every collection is different. You know, some do have indexing, some don't. Um, as, as I said, like the court record indexing, we don't have full indexing for the more modern court, as many of the records as we have from it, the civil district court. We, that's not, that's not particularly indexed in full. Um, so like you have to go through the docket books, you know, date by date or, or docket number by docket number to try to find something. Um, mm -hmm like uh goodness um we do generally try to inventory all the city records all the city records have inventories that describe on a box and sometimes a folder level what we have in each one in terms of indexing names um you're not going to find an index of names mentioned in say mayor skiro's collection that's that's not a thing you'll just need to um if you think a name was mentioned in one of his like administrative papers, you would need to find the administrative folder that you think is most likely and look through it. It just, it just depends on what collection you're talking about. 
right. many of the genealogy ones aren't are sorry are but you know just as likely might not be and that's why we have um to thank irene and wayne for creating that guide to genealogical materials because it does go on a collection by collection basis telling you mm -hmm. how things are available and indexed uh, yeah I've, I've found that even though it, it's a lot more work to go through uh, unindexed records sometimes the things you find are just uh, amazing if, if you oh. can narrow down to where you need to look right you know, specific yes um and now, now Gail is asking, uh, where would adoption records uh, from the 1890s be held? Do you have anything adoption like that? Adoption records. So you're not going to like my answer. Um, Louisiana is a closed record state. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, um, adoptions were handled by private charitable organizations, mostly affiliated with the Catholic Church. But even within the Catholic Church, it fragments beyond that because certain orders lost all their records, like whether it be in Katrina or a fire or, you know, at various times throughout. So adoption records are hard to find. Um, number one, as I said, Louisiana is a closed record state, especially for adoptions. We have closed adoptions. Um, what this means in terms of looking for adoption records from the 1890s is I would start with the archdiocese simply because so many orphanages were run by the Catholic church and Catholic orders. Um, if they, if it happens to be from an order that the records were lost, uh, you know, unfortunately it's tough. I mean, really the best place to start always is orphan schedules on the census, which you can find um, on Ancestry and Heritage Quest. Um, now there are a couple of uh, private charitable organizations that weren't church affiliated. Um, there's, uh, I believe, a boys home in Poiter's house um, that uh, Tulane's Louisiana Research Center has some records of. They just happen to end up there. But because none of this was run and by a municipal organization, except for one, one thing, we have one like very short, like 1853 to 1857 um, mayoral book that was called The Record of Destitute Orphans that's completely transcribed on our website in full. But it's such a limited amount of time and it's not even the 1890s. So in short, my answer is to start with the Archdiocese, which um, the link to the Archdiocese of New Orleans is, is in the handout. Um, and beyond that, try the census, but there's never a guarantee with orphanage records, especially in New Orleans. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to get through the record. I that. Um, following a lot, well, a lot similar lines, but uh, B. Buckley, is asking uh, if there are any records for pauper's graves. Do you have anything like that? So um, the pauper's, um, the, the, uh, the progression of pauper's graves in New Orleans is interesting. The earliest ones, no, there's not. Um, the next one that sort of came to be was Holt Cemetery. It has, um, it has mixed mixed availability. Uh, many of the city municipal records are, are kind of hard to, to peg down. What we do have, of course, is described on our page in the genealogical guide in the burial section. So you can find anything you need to about Holt there. Um, now, Holt records are spotty. At some point, um, in 1967, I say at some point, in 1967, Holt stopped being the uh, Potter's Field, and that was later transferred and, and is today the Greenwood Cemetery. That's where um, unclaimed um, remains from the coroner's office are buried now. Um, Holt has some indexing. Some of that indexing is with us. Some of that is with the um, Division of Cemeteries, which let me um, type their uh, address into the chat really quick because I'm not sure if I have. I may have it in the handout. I know I didn't have it on the, um, on the, uh, oh gosh, how do I switch to everyone? Oh, there it is, yes. Um, so it's nola.gov slash cemeteries. And, and when I recommend this, it's really for more recent records, like rec records since like 53, I believe, 1953. Um, 
but yeah, Popper, Popper's records are very spotty. What we do have will be whatever's listed for Holt. We don't have the previous one. Let me take just a second, see if I can, um, no, I'm not, no mind, I'm not gonna do that. I was gonna try to screen share to show how to save the chat, but I do want to remind everybody that you can go into the chat window and down the lower right, there's a little three button ellipsis, which is the more, and it will give you the option to um, uh, save your chat. So the links that uh, are typed in will be available to you later on after the day. Uh, that's the one that the manager just put in. Okay. Um, let me go back to my questions here. Um, so I have a, a question here from Charlotte uh, Bocage. Uh, from Los Angeles. I hope I'm saying the name right, Charlotte. Um, Charlotte asks, are there epidemic records available for people that have died in epidemics? So I have a, a, a related question. Uh, go, go ahead and answer that and then I'll follow up. Oh, okay. So pandemic records. There's a partial index. It's available on US Gen Web archives, actually. And um, also... There's, um, I know Save Our Cemeteries and NOLA Catholic Cemeteries are working on additional transcriptions of additional names of pandemic um, uh, deaths. It, it's, the thing is, is these records only for the major years, I wanna say, were collected. Um, all the other, pan, I mean, all the other like pandemic yellow fevers, which they, they were every like five to 10 years for a great long time, it's, it's, you want to find your death certificate is what you want to find. You just want to find the death certificate and see that um, the, um, or, or an obituary that says died of the prevailing epidemic or, you know, uh, the yellow fever, you know, um, mm -hmm. the, um, there was another name for it as well, which I can't, I'm so sorry, y'all, I'm blanking on the name. But um, there is, um, actually, can I share, I, I feel like it might be helpful for me to share the website really quick. Um, let's see here. While you're doing that, I'll go ahead and follow up with my, what I was thinking of. My question. Yeah, then you're asking questions. Yeah, I have a, uh, I have an ancestor supposedly who uh, served in the War of 1812 there and then stayed and, and then died in either a cholera or a uh, yellow fever epidemic. Uh, I'm looking for any evidence of that happening because I'm not finding any evidence that this person actually existed. So, so yeah, again, we, we do always have to come back to the fact that none of these records was required until 1918. Right. But you would try to hope to find one. Um, mm -hmm. So 1812, as, 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 as you can see here, we do have the index to death records, or we, these, you know, Secretary of State website, the one that I drilled on sos.la.gov over and over again, um, has the Board of Health index to death records. And it's also available on the Orleans Parish page of the US Gen Web project, as we're looking at here, and um, the Board of Health certificate. So we have these on microfilm, but again, you can also order these through the Secretary of State. Unfortunately, I, I think I found the name one time in a list of uh, like a, a newspaper, uh, mm -hmm. a newspaper archive. There's a list of people. They were just naming lists of people that had. Yeah, they died. did sometimes do that. And then, of course, I was I was a bad genealogist, and I, and I remembered. I thought I'll go back. I'll remember to go back and do that and get that. And now I can't find it. Um, yeah, it's it's tough. You always want to make sure you record these things, but they did do that periodically. But there's not exactly a, a comprehensive index of that either mm -hmm. um let me um so uh what we do have readily available on yellow fever is a transcription of d the number of deaths <laughs> mm -hmm. so that's here um so it's the number of deaths in each each um epidemic year which basically you know almost every year obviously you can see there are worse ones 1853 was a big one, but 1858 wow, yeah. was pretty big too. You know, there's a huge one in 1878. Um, the yeah. ones that I think um, they are working on transcribing a list for are the 1878 and the 1853 one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And some of this is transcribed at U.S. Gen Web archives too. Okay, and I have another question. This is this is my question because what you were some of the things you're talking about uh, made me curious. 
Do you know, or could you explain what goes into flattening a court record? If, if somebody asks you for a document that hasn't been flattened, what goes into fl uh, flattening that? Okay. So um, all of the court cases traditionally um, by the courts and the clerks were tri-folded. Mm -hmm. um, they're on this, like generally on a cotton rag, but later on like cellulose with um, some acidic modifiers. And so these, they were tri and quarter folded into these rolls and they were put in those little um, legal um, drawers where the drawers are very tall and straight and they were just mm -hmm. put in there. So they, they have remained in that position for anywhere for one to 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> and time has solidified them. So if we're in a situation where you're looking for a criminal court record that has not yet been flattened and we do find it, what we do is we place it in a rehumidification chamber for several days. It's very gentle. It gently loosens up the um, paper to the point that we can unfold it and actually open it. And then at that juncture, we put it between um, layers of like nonstick and uh, porous materials under weights like Holytex and um, um, uh, rag board to flatten it. And then once it's flattened, you know, it's assembled in order and put in a folder and, and cataloged as being flattened. And, um, but that, that process can take up to two weeks. Oh, yeah, that sounds right. I had to have a, a document I requested unflattened one time. I was curious about it. Yeah, they said it was about two weeks ago, yeah. Uh, well, interesting. Thank yeah, you. I mean, the problem is they'll just snap in your hands. They'll just break if you don't. I imagine, yeah. If you don't go through this process, you know. Yeah. So I have a question here from uh, Elizabeth Wynn. Uh, Elizabeth says, where were graves moved from Catholic St. Louis Cemetery? Uh, number one, during the building of the canal, we learned that a part of St. Louis number one was destroyed. Uh, we had a relative buried in number one in 1822 during a yellow fever epidemic. When we searched for the grave, we learned that it was in a section of number one that was in the path of the canal project. Would that be something that would, that sort of information would be something that you might have? I mean, that's going to be, um, no, you would want to go to NOLA Catholic cemeteries for more information about that, actually. So, so this is, um, I'm going to take you to our guide to genealogical materials so you can kind of see it in action. As you can see, it's my favorite link here. Um, so burial records. So number one, um, did you, she said St. Louis? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So St. Louis is Catholic. Um, and then uh, let's see here. Yeah, specifically St. Louis number one. Yeah, so there's some indexing from the 1930s as you can see. And so in February, 1847, the board of church wardens of the St. Louis church agreed to relinquish to the first municipality, the section of St. Louis number one fronting on St. Louis street. Um, so these are renunciations. These would be renunciations of the vault owners. So this, this may actually, um, be uh, worth looking at. It is, of course, um, let's see here, it's microfilm. I'm not sure, it, it's, 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 I believe it's on a roll shared with a different record group, which is why it says 1842 to 1841 to 1842. Um, I would say, go ahead and send me an email um, with the name. You know, I can see if I can take a look at this renunciation and see if perhaps the family was there to to renounce it. Mm -hmm. um, so like the resolution was provided that if any families preferred to remove their relative remains to private vaults, the municipality would pay for the construction of these vaults on ground. Of course, you know, the thing is, is I the family had to have been there and had to have taken part in this or had had to have taken advantage of this government program, <laughs> much like we have to today. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that might be a place we would wanna look. Um, go ahead and email me. Uh, you can email me directly. Let me just give you my direct, I'll put my direct email address in, in the chat here. There you go. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, that's, that, those are all the questions that I have. I just want to thank you again on that uh, backfield uh, uh, presentation. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sue.
Amanda, it was an amazing amount, again, just an amazing amount of information. Um, I, I just, it, it's one, it's just, we're, I think all of us are overwhelmed. It's, it's one of the most amazing amounts of information that I think that all of us have. So much stuff written down to go back and look at. You know, the, the mug shots, I bet even if we didn't have anything like that, we're going to go look at the mug shots just for fun. I thank you so much. Um, we appreciate it. And thank you for your personal email for people that still want to get uh, in touch with you. And to remind you again, if you still want to save the chat, there are three little dots um, down by where uh, you can type in and it says save chat. And if you click that, it will save to your computer and you'll have the links and Amanda's personal email. Amanda. <laughs> Please feel we're, we're always, um, yes. you know, like, obviously, um, I, I try to respond within 72 hours, depending on the volume of requests we have, but um, I should be able to generally help you with any questions that you have and get you pointed to the right resource. Well, thank you. And, you know, you can tell, you know, as as a, a colleague information provider, we love our jobs and that's what we're there for. So by all means, utilize the sources that Amanda gave us today. Uh, contact her if you have to, and then contact us also um, if you would like to, like to contact Amanda. Again, thank you so much, oh. everyone. And Amanda, again, will be in touch. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a good afternoon. You too.